as you see animal metabolic bone disease accompanying chronic kidney disease and worsen as the ckd progresses and it is likely that both process contribute to the increased morbidity and mortality seen in the ckd so what we believed in long back that the 20% of our uremic symptom is contributed by the anemia and about the metabolic bone disease it's not only fracture is basically the the worsen that uh, cv outcome the hypertension everything is contributed by the mineral bone disease so it is basically that intimal and medial calcification so this is also active process and this is a part of mineral bone disease so anemia is due to decreased production of erythropoietin but that is a very simplistic attitude uh, anemia is because of erythropoietin and hfc which i'm coming later on and bone disease is due to decreased production of calcitriol desired excretion a decreased excretion of phosphorus increased synthesis of parathormone and that can be seen early ckd and they are relatively easy to diagnose and treat and provide an opportunity for the primary care provider to potentially decrease some risk associated with ckd so it's up to you you know you will be seeing this patient with a 60 gfr 50 gfr 40 gfr and if you can treat this treatment early you can save a lot of life you can save a lot of mortality and morbidity so as the gfr worsens the incidence of ckd uh, becomes more and more so by the time the patient reaches dialysis more than 95% patients are anemic and you see that with the worsening anemia the increased number of death increased number of morbidity increased number of severe hospitalization and there is a progression of disease so it's very important to treat the find the anemia early treat the anemia early to prevent the progression as well and increase the i mean decrease the death and severe hospitalization so this is this is how you know this is the pathophysiology of anemia you see it's oh sorry so i don't know where's the pointer Okay, anyway, so there is a decreased production of ESA from the, uh, from the kidney. So there is a peritubular fibroblast which produces the kidney, uh, produces erythropoietin, so there is a decreased production. We now know that it is basically an impaired hip signaling that causes the decreased uh, erythropoietin production. But the problem, the real problem is the hepcidin. Hepcidin is a 25 amino acid polypeptide which is uh, formed in the liver and gets cleared by the kidney which is not getting cleared in the CKD. And then in the inflammation, the CKD is inflammatory state, so you have a more hepcidin coming into the blood. That hepcidin causes the decreased absorption of iron and discrete recycling of the iron. So you have a lot of iron in the store, but you don't have the iron available for the anemia management, and you have decreased erythropoietin as well. So you know then uh, the anemia worsens. So what we did about this anemia management before 1990, what we did is we just transfused the patient. We gave a lot of useless iron to the patient, and what we did is we made the patient iron overloaded, we kill the patient by transfusion reaction, we kill the patient by infection and there is a lot of viral disease transmission and there is a sensitization making the transplant useless. So in 1990, when erythropoietin came, we thought our problem is solved. So we had a very good run for 20 years till 2010 and there are a lot of biosimilars came and a lot of trial happened and we thought that we are happy and these are the thing. So at the same time when this erythropoietin came, we have some new irons coming because there is an iron absorption which is hindered from the duodenum and early part of the intestine because of hepcidin. So now we have this liposomal iron which gets absorbed like a chylomicron from the M, M type of cell in the pear patch. So this gets absorbed. So we have this liposomal iron, we use them frequently. Uh, rheumatologists favor the heme iron polypeptide. We are not using this ferrous sulfate and ferrous fumarate anymore. Ferric citrate is a very good product. I'll be talking about a little. Ferric maltol you don't have, but this is licensed for the use in the IBD patients. You can give them their results are fine. At the same time, we have uh, research on the iron preparation. So gone are those days when we killed people with dextran and their allergic reaction. So we have sucrose. When sucrose came, we are very happy. And now we have ferromoxetol and ferric isomaltosides and ferric carboxymaltose. It's something like, you know, you give the iron. If the iron gets liberated in the blood first, then you have the reaction and you have the oxidant damage because the free level iron will cause the oxidant damage. But this newer molecule has got a very hardcore carbohydrate cell. It's like something like, you know, having eclairs. When you suck on that eclair, that chocolate comes very slowly. So this iron liberates very slowly. So what happened with this molecule, what you could do, you can give a large dose of iron very rapidly and make life easier for the patient. So, uh, and when this thing came and then we know that, we know that Giving proactively iron to CKD patients increases the, their lifestyle and decreases the CV mortality. We can target a very high ferritin and very high TIVC. So, after EPO, 
and this add on. So, current management of renal anemia is erythropoidin and add on. That's all you know. And transfusion is for the EPO hyperlysis patient. So, an acute blood loss. So, that was the thing. So, we thought that a pinch of ESA and a pinch of iron and mixed everything with wisdom and we solved our problem. No, it is not. What happened with this four trial? Normal hematocrit trial, create, choir, and treat trial. We found that there is an increased CV adverse event, seizure, thrombosis, hypertension, if you try to normalize the patient with ESA. And specifically, it was found that the patients who are hyper-responsive, they did bad. And the higher ESA was maybe associated with morbidity and CV complication, and they're independent of target hemoglobin. So we don't know what killed those patients, whether the high erythropoietin dose or the hyper-responsiveness or the factor that was contributing to hyper-responsiveness. But whatever it is, the recommendation came that don't use ESA to increase the hemoglobin more than 11. Forget about physical quality of life index. So use ESA to avoid transfusion. And ESA got a black box warning from FDA. Then iron is increased, iron related uh, adverse effect increase, transfusion increase, the purpose became defeated. So there's a lot of research went on. These are the molecules that the research went on. The problem with the molecules and the research is that a lot of money is spent on this research and when you try to develop a molecule, at probably at the final stage of development or when you are like commercializing the product after you know spending billions on the product, and there is a untoward such in adverse event comes and that halts the progression, halts the commercialization. So a lot of money is spent and people are not very enthusiastic about bringing the new molecule. But this one molecule, these are the molecules that have been tried. And this is the molecule that stood the state of the time. This is hypoxia inducible factor. What is hypoxia inducible factor? It is there in our body, in our cells, every cell. So what happens when there's a hypoxia, this hypoxia inducible factor comes into play in a way that prevents the cell death, cell damage, till the oxygen, oxygenation is restored. So, you know, when there's a hypoxia, what the cell would try to do? Cell would shift the, the metabolic demand to anaerobic glycolysis. So this heap transcribes the enzyme responsible for anaerobic glycolysis. It transcribes the enzyme for you know, iron, for erythropoietin, for VJ, for a lot of hundred genes this transcribes, but it transcribes the oncogene as well. So this is how it is. You know, the hip is basically hip alpha and hip beta, two subunits. So when there is a hypoxia, hip alpha heterodimers with the hip beta goes into the nucleus, stimulates the hypoxia response element, and then this, 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 this transcribes a whole lot of gene that is a complete you know, erythropoietic package. You look at this, erythropoietin increase, EPO receptor increase, hepcidin decreased, iron related and absorption related, all these uh, enzymes are increased. What happened in normoxia? When there is a normoxia, this heap prolyl hydroxylase, that is the enzyme which destroys the alpha. So if you can prevent that heap prolyl hydroxylase, then you can create a pseudo hypoxia, you can mimic the hypoxia, you can you use that heap prolyl hydroxylase over there. So you have the pseudo hypoxia and then you stimulate the heap. So you have this result. So these are the molecules that are there's another molecule, sorry, in order to start. Uh, these are the six molecules which are available in Japan. Uh, Roxadostat is the first molecule that came and I was, I was very happy to be a part of this team when I did the trial 2015 to 18 as a part of multi, uh, global multicentric trial, but it didn't uh, like, it didn't get the USFD. I think you'll get the USFD approval this time, 2025. Uh, and and Decidustat. Decidustat is our own Indian product by Jidas. Uh, I was involved into that program as well. So this is the Roxadostat program where I started including the patients in 2015. Fantastic drug to use. And 2018, we finished the trial. Uh, it's available in Europe and Bangladesh and China, not in India and US. Uh, this is another phase three trial. That was a global multicentric trial in 26 countries. This is a trial which happened in India, Sri Lanka, and the South country. It was a part of this phase three trial as well. It was another good molecule, and I was, I'm currently undergoing the phase four study with the Desirostat. It is a wonderful drug. The best part is that you don't need a refrigerator, you don't need a cold chain. This is a tablet. You take thrice a week and you know it's cheaper than it's, it's just uh say half or one third the price of erythropoietin and darbobitin and this is where you know if you see that you use heat in the ESA hyper responsive patient and chronic inflammatory state that means you use it everywhere so it has got an advantage over that you use it everywhere but one note of question that you know active proliferative retinopathy you don't use it in ADPK you don't use it patient has an acute thrombotic event within three months you don't use it Patient with active malignancy, obviously you don't use it. And a patient has to be cured of malignancy for five years before you start this product. So uh, this is a lot of research going on. Bone disease, uh, right. so Mo et al coined this term chronic bone disease and mineral, uh, mineral bone disorder. 
which compresses our disorder of calcium, phosphate, parathyroid, vitamin D, and FGF23. This disruption alters the bone morphology. We know about renal osteodystrophy. When the renal osteodystrophy comes to your mind, then you think about renal osteitis fibrosis cystica, which is a high turnover bone disease. But then there is something called adynamic bone disease, which is more prevalent, where bone is very inactive, you know, and the calcium gets deposited in the vascular part and the uh, cardiac part. So you have metastatic calcification, vascular calcification, and cardiovascular death in this patient. So derangement of calcium, phosphate, PTH, and vitamin D, along with their effect of turnover and extraskeletal calcification is the part of that syndrome. So all the most features appear when the glomerular filtration rate falls below 40, when then, then you start measuring the calcium and phosphorus. But some elements like clotho, FGA, this, this, this disarrangement starts pretty early, you know, at, at, the, at the GFR of 60. So, you know, even the hospital calcification starts at that time. So that's why I say like you as a primary care physician has got a lot, lot, lot of role to play. So compelling evidence indicates a causal relationship between this disarrangement and numerous adverse clinical outcomes. So these are the these are the way that mineral, mineral bone disease happens: calcium, phosphate, PTH, and calcitriol and fibroblast growth factor. The pathology is simple: is that when your GFR decreases, your phosphate retain you retain phosphate, and then that retained phosphate causes the hypocalcemia. Hypocalcemia, you know, stimulates the calcium sensing receptor in the parathyroid and the PTH increase. PTH has got a systemic toxicity and bone disease. At the same time. You have phosphorus directly acting on the 125 hydroxylase, and then you know active vitamin D3 is reduced with the renal mass decrease, active 125 reduced, and that you know could directly stimulates the parathormone to increase the parathormone. Uh, so this is this is kind of a, a nutshell that mineral bone disease. The real picture is something like this: you know you have increased FGF, you have a decreased clotho, you have that FGF you know, decreases the vitamin D3 that increases the PTH. So it's kind of vicious cycle goes on and then you lose the bone mineral density, they will lose the bone mineralization, increase the bone turnover. But keep in mind that if you use a lot of calcium chromate, you know, as we tend to use, and especially in the diabetic patients, you use a lot of calcium there, you increase the calcium, then you suppress the PTH and you have a dynamic bone disease. So bone is inactive. So all this calcium are getting deposited in the in the, in the myocardium, in the intima, in the medial side. So you are having a dynamic bone disease is worse than high turnover bone disease in terms of cardiovascular outcome. So that is why you have to measure calcium and phosphorus and this is bone alkaline phosphate, sorry, and IPTH at a regular interval. This is the interval, stage four, three to six months, and stage five dialysis that we do every one to three months. Bone alkaline phosphate is 12 months and 12 months and PTH frequently. So once you do that, you have to remember these targets, you know. Your calcium should be always below 10.4 and your phosphorus in the stage 3 should be 2.7 to 4.6. You don't have to really suppress phosphorus. Remember this. You don't have to really suppress phosphorus, increase calcium. And in that stage 5, you keep it around 3.5 to 5.5. About the PTH, PTH should be at a higher level because inactive 784 fragments is increased in the... So some 2 to 9 times of upper limit of normal is a better way to target around 150 to 600. This also depends on vitamin D level. This also depends on your bone biopsy report. So treatment is, if your patient is vitamin D deficient, you have to give vitamin D. It's just plain simple 60,000 vitamin D. The argument is that if your 125 hydroxylase enzyme is not there in the kidney, well, how this will get converted into active vitamin D, that is 125 hydroxycholinalciferol. The point is that that vitamin D has got a pleiotropic effect also. It can prevent cancer, it can sensitize insulin. So if your patient is a vitamin D deficient, you have to give the vitamin D to act in the vitamin D receptor. And calcitriol, obviously, to suppress the PTH. And dietary phosphate rest restriction has to be there, but it's very tough to restrict phosphate because, you know, phosphate comes from the animal protein. So you have to go to the plant-based protein, but the patient will suffer malnutrition. That is a problem. So you use phosphate binders. So these are the phosphate binders which are available. Calcium acid and calcium carbonate. I talked about it. The problem is that too much of suppression, hypercalcemia. Ferric citrate, that is the product I was talking about. This ferric citrate is a unique product which is a phosphate binder and donates a lot of iron. I really love this molecule because you know the dialysis patients when I use them, you just can keep the dialysis patient on oral therapy only. Ferric citrate and you know, hip PHI. And the interesting part is that this is the only molecule which suppresses FGF23. So that has got an added advantage, you know, better cardiovascular outcome. Lanthanum carbonate, we don't have anymore. Cephalomar carbonate is the maximally used, you know, you all that use that safeguard and phosphate. But the another advantage is that probably decreases LDL, which can be a beneficial for the patients. Sucroferic 
uh, oxide does a bad molecule to use. I cannot use that. I really tried using this, but then patient very non compliant because of very metallic test. Uh, obviously, use calcitrol, but again, remember when you're using calcitrol, don't increase the calcium too much, don't increase the phosphate too much, and don't suppress the PTH too much. Sinacalcid is a pro uh, product which acts directly on the CSR, calcium sensing receptor, which can decrease the, and, the, and, and we can call it a, you know, metabolic com a, a kind of medical uh, parathyroidectomy, but uh, it's not all that effective and we ultimately has to go to, you know, parathyroidectomy. Cholecalciferol, as I, as I said, that you use it to act on the vitamin D receptor. So as a primary care provider, you are the first line of defense and primary care profession can play a significant role in early diagnosis, treatment and patient education. So this is why I give the brief picture of the you know, practice oriented treatment. A greater emphasis on detecting CKD and managing it prior to referral can improve patient outcomes. And CKD is a part of primary care. It's not that I who say that. This is the NKF lecture is that CKD is a part of primary care because we are very few in number. You won't be reaching everywhere. So it's up to you. You handle the patient outside till stage three up to 30 GFR and then probably you should take the nephrology concept but with the molecule SGLT2 and phenylalanine coming if you can use it fine if you cannot use it you can use earlier so that referral depends so basically early referral actually has got a role in a sense that in early versus late referral you see overall mortality one year mortality hospital length of stay serum albumin at the start of dialysis hematocrit all is significantly impaired so, but I would say that, you know, till 30, you keep on seeing the patient with this idea. So, conclusion is that anemia and bone disease commonly occur as a consequence of CKD and become more severe as CKD progresses and contribute to the increased morbidity and mortality seen in the CKD. Remember, starts at 60, 60 to 30 you have to see and you have to know this. Both abnormalities can be relatively easily diagnosed with the parameters. The development of new strategies to treat anemia is still an evolving and fascinating area of experimental and clinical research. At present, the most molecule promising class of agent, as I said, those do stat, decidostat, oxidostat, deprotostat, molitostats. Uh, uh, there are 33 phase three clinical trials have been done. The emergence of new oral and IV iron preparation had widely extended the possibility of iron supplementation in your IDA. Actually, you know, you can treat those patients in your in their house with these IV molecules. They're fantastic molecules. So, as a primary care professional, this you play an important role in the treatment of the CKD at the earlier stage. You identify the risk factor help your patient adjust medication, modify the diet, and we are there to help you. Thank you.